Uh, Prof, talk to me about the, 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 the dwindling popularity of him, of Alan, uh, and what people think he's putting up some excuse to, to just opt out of the race. This is data. Salam, you're right. This is data. And uh, if I go back to my original principle, uh, which Nkrumah states clearly in his uh, conscientism uh, book, uh, the principle of sufficient reason, I would not fault anyone who actually would interpret the data uh, from that perspective. But I would say that your explanation has to be compelling enough uh, by considering, you know, scenarios. Now, uh, from the data that you presented, let's ask ourselves whether... And I think that the source, you know, the source uh, data is actually 2007. Uh, the, 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 where we can actually make the analysis from is from 2007. By 2007, are we saying that that was the first time Nanado actually had contested the presidential primaries? No, he had contested uh, what do you call Kufu long ago in Sunyani, which I think was 19, what was it, 1995? or there about 90, uh, 98 98 exactly nanado had contested uh, what do you call uh, kufo then very popular so by that analysis of those who say that the dwindling of Ireland, let's look at that when nanado had contested you know kufo and he was popular then so the assumption is that that race between him and alan should have been a walk in the path if we take those who are actually arguing that, you know, we take them from that rational perspective, then, of course, he was supposed to overly win that contest, yet it was a runoff. When it was a runoff, uh, Alan had gone on to cede that space to him. Now, going forward, don't forget, the understanding had been that it is now the turn of Nanado. That's why Alan actually ceded that position. So on the basis of people understanding, if he hadn't clinched that presidential election uh, with NDC... So, so, so that's the 2007 source data. You, that's correct. That's you, the you source data. Yeah. yeah, that's the source data. Now, so if he had gone into that election and hadn't actually succeeded against NDC, he still is in the time that was referred to in 2007, that it is still his time he had to go for another one. That's why he was given another chance. Then the question is, why did Alan contest, knowing that it is still Nanado's time? You know, in political, you know, uh, contest, coronation is one, but usually people would argue that it is not legitimacy. You want to see that you are hugely popular, you have contested and won. Alan, knowing that he wants to become or he wants to succeed Nanado, would still want to keep the base going. So he would organize, and that's the understanding as a strategist. That's how I put it. Of course, people can make their own you know, explanation. But I'm saying that your explanation has to be compelling enough. Now, knowing that he has that ambition to succeed Nanado, he would put together a system, an engine, to keep the base running. So he will contest again. Now, once he contests again, he will contest again, surely, the basis of the people's understanding is that Nanado had to become president, which started from 2007. And so if you say that the numbers are actually showing that he was dwindling and so is popularity, I don't think so. I differ because the basis had been set in 2007 that Nanado had become, has to become president. Until that objective is fulfilled, you cannot see Alan Trump and Nanado with those data. Now, the argument about, you know, him contesting currently and coming third. Now, the only moderating factor, uh, the mediation factor in terms of presidential leadership is that you must contest an election before you become a president, all right? So that is one uh, level relationship. Now, your chances of winning has, has to, however, be moderated by so many other factors, all right? So... Whether you would become the president in terms of having participated would be, one, your popularity, two, resources. So many other factors. So the question is, what are the factors that actually be uh, moderated uh, 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 in that relationship between him becoming the candidate in recent times? And that is the factor that he has actually put out. I mean, he's put out certain factors that determines that there is a certain 
machination, there's a certain mechanism measures that had been put in place in order that I don't become. Now, if those factors were not available and we were actually allowing delegates to vote according to the so-called ideal processes, i.e. put them in one congregated area, remove those many variables that are factors that he has actually highlighted, would he have actually won or would he have still been third? That is the question. His, his actually chances is, uh, depends largely on going forward, mm. the kind of actions he takes and the strategies he put, he put forward. Now, uh, let's analyze the scenarios in terms of evaluating which one uh, mm. could be the best. Obviously, uh, political parties from our constitution are the conduit you know, for uh, participation, uh, you know, obviously. Uh, parties might have or should have, you know, ideology uh, uh, with which they can attract people. So people join political parties. I remember political party participation or political participation are in different forms. Mm. Either you are voting or you are an activist or you are a party leadership, you know, serving as a flag bearer, etc. Now, for those who actually join political parties, you know, as members of political parties and as activists. They're actually attracted by, you know, one, the first and foremost, or foremost is the ideology, because leadership change, you know, and although leaders would have to reflect on the ideology of the political parties, they come with their own, you know, uh, 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 differences as well. So you would see that Donado's leadership of MPP is different from Kufo's leadership of MPP again, Kufos from uh, Edubwain, for example. So there are tweaks, although broadly speaking, they all assign to, or they all, you know, connect to a certain ideology that we say center-right you know, in our political parlance. Uh, and so the political parties will come with it, ideology, but of course, it's, you know, traditions over the years, it's track record. And again, the personalities in the political party, all right? So... Uh, not only him, Alan, but there must be other people you know, in the political party. Now, would these factors be a constraint or an advantage in drawing people, i.e. especially from the MPP stock, because he's coming from the MPP, and there's an understanding that perhaps he would draw people from MPP. Now, if he's drawing the people, would the people be attracted by these things that I've talked about, that is a consideration that we have to we have to take. Now, if he's going independent, uh, again, there's a certain perspective that voters have in terms of uh, critical mass of people in you know a certain unit that would actually persuade them to think. Given power, you will be able to execute what you say you be you you would do. Uh, but of course, you may not have the constraint of people having diverse interest and diverse you know, perspective on how things must be done. So perhaps as an independent, you can attract everybody else, technocrats, etc. And so you wouldn't have the baggage of political parties or that the political parties have where you have to negotiate, you know, your way out for people to agree with you before, you know, you, you actually prosecute a certain strategy or a certain program. So you know, the way forward, obviously, is clear for participation. Uh, one, you become an independent candidate. Two, uh, you form a political party. Or three, you throw your weight behind someone. Or you sit, you sit you know, aloof, so to speak. So let's say four. But each of these have advantages and disadvantages. So I think that uh, going forward, he would, as he said, would have to sit and have a very thoughtful processes and see which way is the best way for him. None of us will be able to tell, uh, of course, but we could see the advantages and the disadvantages. Whether he stands a chance, uh, let's again go back to history. I mean, uh, Nkrumah is the most, you know, paramount example that you could almost, you know, uh, 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 what do you call, prominent example that you can cite. He left UGCC and of course, you know, formed his own party. Uh, we know the results, of course, uh, for both parties, for UGCC and for CPP. Uh, now, we cannot perhaps argue that 
the the strength of Nkrumah is parallel to that of Alan Chomantin. And the circumstances the are different, are they not? <clears throat> this man has lost an election. Or, I mean, didn't do well in an election. Nkrumah did not face an election at the time he moved away from the UGCC. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I'm saying. Time and space, obviously, the dynamics of it and the political system. So you could actually play all those factors in it and see how it turns out. Now, for let's use the recent you know, happenings as an example, because going back then, it isn't too far. If we look at our, you know, uh, what do you call, fourth Republican constitution era, uh, let's take the personalities and the political parties. If we take, for example, Kwesindum on CPP, which CPP is an existing structure, all right? Kwesindum, at the time, people had the expectation that he can impact the geopoly that we had, uh, because he willed uh, quite a huge personality, but from business. Now, the transitioning from business into political leadership in the voters' mind is completely different. People might, you know, see you as a very good leader, uh, but when you are actually transferred from that, you know, uh, what do you call, space onto a political space, it would give them different you know, uh, perspectives. And uh, some, uh, another example was whether, you know, uh, our, you know, uh, what do you call, darling, uh, 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 forgotten, the UN uh, Secretary General, Kofi Annan, for example, could become, you know, uh, could possibly be voted into power. And when the survey was done, I think, I remember it was about 34% or so people were actually given. So voters thinking of who is fit for a certain leadership you know, differ. So if you look at Kosindum then and the idea that he couldn't actually make the kind of impact that we thought he could, you know, on CPP tickets, uh, that could be completely different scenario. And as we said, the dynamics at the time was different from now. Now, when Kosindum formed his party, which is a PPP, again, the impact was negligible. Now, we saw Abu Sakara, fantastic candidate, we didn't have, and I don't think Ghanaian voters had enough impression about him uh, before he became the candidate for CPP. But when he was running, the campaign, of course, campaign has effect. The campaign really molded him. Uh, people saw that, indeed, he was a formidable candidate. But, of course, they, get, they gave their votes to somebody else because perhaps they didn't think that the CPP had the critical mass of leadership that could be entrusted with the leadership of the country. So that didn't actually make any impact. Now, let's look at Alan and now. I have argued that our political system now has dramatically changed from those days because you hear quite a lot of people talk about the third force, the third force. Now, I'm sure that, you know, Salem on your shows, people have said that a number of times. On the street, people are talking about that. Now, on social media spaces, I have, I mean, on Twitter spaces, I have actually heard quite a number of Twitter spaces that people are talking about, a third force. People have seen what has happened, you know, in Nigeria and are drawing examples, you know, for that. Of course, people are also aware of what is transpiring within the MPP and then, of course, uh, uh, with, with uh, what do you call, with Alan Chermanton. Could it be possible that people would think that he's the best fit to perhaps, you know, provide a particular third force? We had done a survey, uh, we did about three surveys. One, we polled MPP delegates, and as I said, the top of the pile were always gearing towards, you know, the vice president. The uh, bottom of the pile were gearing towards Alan Chomanto, which you have actually said on your show. We polled NDC delegates during their elections whether who they, uh, who they thought was competitive against NDC or against John Mahama. A lot of people tipped in you know, Alan Chermanton. And then we did a national poll, which we featured it on Daily Graphic for people to scan and also answer. And overwhelming number actually tipped Alan Chermanton as the most competitive against John mm. Mahama, for example. Now, Given these scenarios that I've, I've talked about, again, with a huge social media presence, and it's important because in the past, you know, channels like yours, traditional media houses, would have to invite someone to contribute to national discourse uh, in terms of, you know, uh, coming into studios, etc. 
These days, people can sit in their rooms, post something on social media, it goes viral. People can influence the political process unofficially. And then, of course, from uh, what we call so many other sources. So, as you said, the dynamics of the time makes it interesting to actually think whether he could make a huge impact you know, in the coming elections. Now, I would not be able to say that he can win, mm. but can he really impact the system? Perhaps, yes, perhaps no, uh, with the examples that I've given. 